David Hahn, also known as the Radioactive Boy Scout, built a nuclear reactor in his mom's backyard out of common household items when he was 17. As shocking as that is, that a teenager built a nuclear reactor at his mom's house, the story of what made it all possible and the terrible mess it created is even more insane. David was born just outside of Detroit, Michigan in 1976. His parents, who both worked for General Motors when they employed basically everyone in the area, unfortunately divorced when David was still very young. Growing up, he spent most of his time living at his dad and stepmom's house and lived on the weekends at his biological mom, Patty's house. When he was 10 years old, his grandfather, his stepmom's dad, gave David a seemingly harmless gift which would start this soon to be out of control chain of events in motion. The gift was a book called The Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments, and David was instantly obsessed. David set up a small laboratory in his bedroom at his father's house, but this wasn't like the pretend fun beakers full of water with food coloring in them type laboratory you might normally find in a kid's room. No, David bought legit beakers, Bunsen burners, test tubes, and lined his shelves with chemistry books in volumes and volumes of the encyclopedia. By 14, when most are messing around with relatively harmless experiments, or making baking soda volcanoes, David had fabricated nitroglycerin. David was also in the Boy Scouts, and one time showed up to a Boy Scout camping trip with a bright orange face caused by an overdose of canthaxanthin, which he claimed he was taking to test methods for artificial tanning. He was literally performing experiments on himself when he was just a kid. On that same trip, David, along with some of his fellow scouts, blew a hole in one of their tents by igniting a stockpile of magnesium David had brought along to make fireworks. Despite the fact that David's father and stepmom were frequently alarmed by small explosions and chemical spills in their son's bedroom, they didn't put a stop to his experimentation. They just made him move his lab setup down to the basement as they were tired of him destroying his room, pockmarking the walls with various explosions and spilling chemicals all over the carpet. This is likely where all of this should have been put to a stop, but it wasn't. And David started heading down an even more dangerous path with his experiments. Banishing him to the basement was actually the opposite of punishing David. Now he just had more room and more privacy to conduct his experiments. He only became more obsessed and more focused on chemistry. He held down a variety of after-school jobs just so he could make money to buy materials to mess with in his laboratory. Soon, David would do something that would cause another change in location for his laboratory. He had gotten a hold of a bunch of red phosphorus, basically match heads, and he placed it in a glass container and started hammering it with a screwdriver. And yeah, it exploded. He injured his hands and arms badly, and he had to have glass, which exploded from the container, removed from his eyes. He had glass shards explode into his eyes, because of course, David wasn't wearing goggles. Again, this seems like the time any parent or guardian would take away the chemistry kit, but in this case, David just moved his lab to his biological mother's potting shed in her backyard, and that's where things started to get radioactive. David would spend countless hours in the shed doing God knows what, but both his mother and his mother's boyfriend never cared to check in on him. They were both just in awe of his work ethic and dedication. One day, David's mom's boyfriend, Michael, did ask him what he was up to, and David responded by saying, you know, someday we're going to run out of oil. And here we go. David's dad thought that his son needed to take his obsessive work ethic and put it towards something useful, becoming an Eagle Scout. Eagle Scouts need to earn 21 merit badges across a variety of disciplines. Some are mandatory, but a few of them are Scouts' choice, as it were. You could earn a badge in business or woodworking, for example, but David went ahead and opted to earn a badge in atomic energy, which raised a red flag to absolutely no one. Even though David was the only Scout in the troop's history to go after that merit badge, and he had a history of blowing himself up. David put together an information pamphlet with the help of several utility companies to go towards earning his atomic energy badge. The general gist of the pamphlet was that nuclear energy was good, nuclear energy was vital, and nuclear energy needed to be studied more. He also made a chart explaining nuclear fission, and a harmless toy model nuclear reactor using a juice can, coat hangers, soda straws, kitchen matches, and a rubber band. David also had the opportunity to visit a hospital's radiology unit to learn how they use radioactive isotopes. And in the end, David was awarded his Atomic Energy Merit Badge on May 10, 1991, just a few months before his 15th birthday. Not content with his fake nuclear reactor he made out of soda cans and coat hangers, David decided he was going to build an actual radioactive nuclear power reactor in his mom's potting shed. And guess what? He did. But to do so, David would have to overcome some obstacles, and a few more adults would have to not ask any questions. 
David set out to build what's known as a breeder reactor, which is a specific type of nuclear reactor that not only generates power, it continuously creates new fuel for itself in an endless self-sustaining cycle. In theory, solving the world's energy problem. There were a few functioning large-scale breeder reactors built, but they were all either shut down for not actually producing cost-effective energy, or they had partial meltdowns. Before we get into the type of stuff David would have to acquire to build a breeder reactor, here's a very simplified explanation of the science behind it. All reactors rely on a bunch of a naturally radioactive element, typically uranium or plutonium, as the fuel for a sustained chain of reactions known as fission. Fission occurs when a neutron combines with the nucleus of a radioisotope, like uranium, and transforms it into a new, highly unstable form of uranium that immediately splits in half, creating a massive amount of energy, and causing a chain reaction of endless combining and splitting and the releasing of energy. Anyway, if that went over your head, don't worry about it. The point is, David would have to get his hands on a bunch of legitimately radioactive and extremely dangerous materials. Which should basically be impossible, right? Nope. Not really. Here's how he did it, and be warned, it will shake your faith in just about everything. Quite simply, David just pretended to be a college professor, writing letters and making phone calls to places like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, the American Nuclear Society, the Edison Electric Institute, and the Atomic Industrial Forum. And then nobody decided to double check David's made up identity. Over the phone, a rep from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ended up basically walking David through the entire process of obtaining and isolating radioactive isotopes. Normally, no one person would be able to legally obtain a large enough amount of the radioactive materials needed to pose any sort of danger. But this isn't a normal situation. This is David freaking Hahn. He was an Eagle Scout. David later said, The NRC gave me all the information I needed. All I had to do was go out and get the materials. And he did. From his conversations with government officials and by looking over old Boy Scout booklets, David learned that you could find small amounts of radioactive elements in smoke detectors, old luminous clocks painted with a radioactive paint that made the numbers on the clock glow, and old camping lanterns. Just one of each of these items wouldn't cut it. David would need a large amount, more than any normal person would ever purchase to get what he needed. So, David just kept on pretending to be a professor and began his journey of procuring radioactive elements from these everyday items until he found something that succeeded in creating fission. First, he called up a smoke detector company and said he needed 100 smoke detectors for a quote, school project. Not only did they agree to ship him 100 smoke detectors for a low price, they told him exactly where the radioactive material was located in the device, without ever getting confirmation of his identity or intentions. David received the smoke detectors, immediately obtained the radioactive material from all of them, which was a Mercium 241 by the way, welded it all together, and placed it inside of a lead casing with a small hole punctured in it, creating what is known as a neutron gun, the first step to achieving fission. Still, no adults have stepped in to stop this. From there, keeping in line with David's obsessively focused work ethic, and keeping in line with the theme of no adults asking any questions or sounding any alarms whatsoever, David was able to extract thorium from thousands of old camping lanterns, and get his hands on radium from old luminescent clocks which he purchased from an antique store. All that along with some uranium he had ordered from Czechoslovakia over the phone because why the hell wouldn't that be possible, and some barium sulfate from the nurses at the local hospital's radiology ward who just sort of gave it to him. David made a makeshift reactor core out of the highly radioactive radium and immersium he had gotten from the smoke detectors and clocks. Then he surrounded this radioactive ball with a blanket composed of tiny foil-wrapped cubes of thorium ash, which he got from the old camping lanterns, and uranium powder, which were stacked in an alternating pattern with carbon cubes and tenuously held together with duct tape. Now he had a fully functional and unspeakably dangerous nuclear reactor in his mom's backyard. And no one had any idea. From there, since David was a teenager and really had no business doing any of this and wasn't exactly famous for his safety precautions in the past, the level of radioactivity from his reactor kept rising. It was already extremely hazardous, but David soon realized that he might be putting other people in danger. Soon, he was able to detect the radiation from his reactor five doors down from his mom's house. At this point, even David decided to dismantle the reactor and try to get all of that radioactive material he created to not be all concentrated in one place. So he did what the pros do, and started to load it into the trunk of his Pontiac. 
At 2.40 a.m. on August 31st, 1994, the police were called by David's neighbors because they thought David was stealing tires from cars. He wasn't. He was simply loading a nuclear reactor into his own car. He told the cops he was just minding his own business, basically, but they didn't trust him. So they searched his car with the fair warning from David that it was, quote, radioactive. This is something the cops didn't like hearing, and they assumed David was in possession of an atomic bomb. The bomb squad was called in, and to the delight of everyone, they realized that David didn't have a homemade atomic bomb. However, they did measure 1,000 times the normal background radiation they should have been measuring, automatically triggering the Federal Radiological Emergency Response Plan. Finally, some adults were stepping in. Uh, kind of. It took two months, two months, for anyone to take any real action. When he was initially arrested, David didn't say anything about his lab in his mom's shed, and nobody took a look. Then when they did take a look, two months after David was arrested, the NRC didn't actually do anything about cleaning up the shed because it was out of their jurisdiction since it wasn't a federally recognized nuclear site. It wasn't until January, five months after David was arrested, that the EPA showed up to David's potting shed lab. What they noted was David's lab, quote, presented an imminent and substantial endangerment to public health or welfare or the environment, and that there was actual or potential exposure to nearby human populations, animals, or the food chain. The memo further stated that conditions such as heavy wind, rain, or fire could cause the contaminants to migrate or be released. And also what they didn't know at that time, but what they came to learn later, is that during those five months of complete inaction, David's mom had thrown away a lot of what was in the shed into just the regular old household trash. If you're following, David's mom, unbeknownst to her, put highly radioactive materials, things that need to be cleaned up, handled, sealed, and buried by professionals, just into the bins, thereby spreading the radiation even farther, exposing more and more people. The EPA's cleanup took place in June. They dismantled the potting shed, sealed it up in bits, and buried it in a dump in the middle of the Great Salt Lake Desert, where it remains entombed alongside radioactive debris from governmental atomic bomb research and other radioactive industrial waste. According to the EPA's official assessment, David's nuclear reactor experiments exposed at least 40,000 people to extremely dangerous, cancer-causing levels of radiation. If there's any sort of lesson to be learned from this, it isn't you shouldn't let kids build nuclear reactors in the backyard. The lesson is rather sobering. And that lesson is, that everyone is just kinda winging it. When presented with a case like David's, none of the grown-ups or government agencies you trust to keep you safe had any idea what to do. Everything is chaos. And we see it again and again right here in America in places like Flint, where the water is poisonous. Or just outside of St. Louis, where there is radioactive waste left over from the Manhattan Project in a landfill, causing unfathomable illness and death to local residents and basically nothing has been done about it. In 1995, the EPA arranged for David to have a full examination to see just what kind of damage all of the radiation he exposed himself to had done, but David refused, fearful of what he might learn. David Hahn died in 2016 when he was 39 of alcohol poisoning, which is, of course, tragic. But the real tragedy here is that it seems like all of this could have been avoided if some adults just decided to pay attention. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to this channel for more of history's weirdness that you won't find in your textbooks. All those textbooks that you had to give back. No one has their textbooks anymore, right? I don't have mine. Anyway, there's this video here. There's this one here. There's more stuff here. There's more good stuff. If you liked it, stick around.